Hi everyone, it's Rabbi Dr. Jack Cohen. It's an honor and a pleasure to address you tonight. Thank God, it's been a wonderful last 30 to 60 days. As many of you know, they rolled out the new Netflix series, Jewish Matchmaker. I had the merit to be involved with that show as shy as Rebbe. I learned a lot from that experience. I'll share some, a lot of the information that I learned with you guys tonight. Um, one of the reasons that I, I believe that I decided to do the show was if there was any way that we as Jews could share the light with the world, then I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be one of the vehicles and one of the agents or catalysts that can show the world the beauty of dating in an orthodox fashion and the wonderful results that lead or come out of it when it's done properly and correctly. It got me thinking that we have what to share with the world and I started thinking back to almost 30 years ago, or maybe 20 plus years ago, when I was teaching dating to many young guys, young men, young women, and one of the first texts that I used was a text that I often rely on and go back to again and again, that's called Shidduch Secrets. It's a fantastic book written by two wonderful women. It lays out tremendous yesodot or foundation principles of how to date effectively. So I thought it'd be a great idea on the heels of Jewish Matchmaker being released that we should undertake now to study successful Jewish dating and to understand what are the obstacles that are getting in the way and how is successful Jewish dating done. And let's start tonight. So before I do that, I always like to put a plug in for my favorite Jewish dating platform and that is Shidduch Profiles, otherwise used to be known as Partners in Shidduchim. It's a great organization, an organization that I'm proud to be part of, an organization that I represent and that I support. It's a fantastic organization because there you can put up your dating resume or profile and it's vetted completely. So you know you're dealing with people that have been checked out. We have a whole team that does that. And so I want to strongly recommend anybody out there, whether they're single or know someone they're single, a relative, a friend, get your dating profile or dating resume up on Shidduch Profiles Plus. It's a great platform. Again, it's well, well screened and uh, there's a great measure of protection. Searching for our soulmate can be one of the most challenging periods of our life. Don't we all know it? Thank God I spend most of my day, if not all of it, six days a week, five and a half, six days a week, sometimes on Shabbos. I'm also asked lots of questions on dating. You know, people want guidance, people want advice, and what seems to be have gone, but you know, used to be simple for our parents is not such a simple matter anymore for this next latter current day generation. It seems that it got so much more difficult to find our soulmate. And to complicate matters, every one of us has ideals and fantasies about the process of how to go about finding my future spouse. We can often blindly accept the myth that's pushed out or advocated by Hollywood that they'll just come into our lives and we'll live happily ever after. And we know that's a bunch of baloney. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way at all. The dating process is cloaked in mystery. Should I judge? Someone with my emotions, or should I use my head? What are the common mistakes that people are making? How can I avoid them if I'm a single? What character qualities or midot or midos should I be looking for in a future spouse? And which ones, the negative ones, should I not overlook? The world of dating has gotten progressively much more complicated, and a lot of it has to do with technology, devices in our hands, the plethora of thousands of thousands of dating resumes that are available to me, swipe to the right, swipe to the left, swipe to the right, swipe to the left, and it's taken, it's sucked out the core ingredient of what used to be the simple method of acquiring a spouse. Our expectations have grown, fueled by the fantasies that Hollywood puts there. We seem to have this concept of wanting it all and having it all. How often do I meet with people who are high 40s and high 50s who have fallen Pray to that trap of wanting it all and having it all. So we need to recognize what are the obstacles that are getting in the way of us finding our beshert or soulmate. And if I ask the million dollar question, why do you think you're still not married yet? We get the answer, well, I just haven't met my soulmate yet. As if something is standing in the way. But if you can do something to facilitate the process going faster, wouldn't you be interested? If there's an obstacle that's standing in the way, that's causing you to delay the process of finding your soulmate. Wouldn't you want to know what that is? And that's important. And that's what we're going to undertake to do tonight. What's getting in the way? What obstacles are stopping us from meeting our soulmate? What's delaying the process? So many students walk into my office with a clear picture of what they want in a partner. 
what they want, not what they need. And tonight, we're going to offer a radical description of what you should be looking for. Not what you want, rather you need to search for what you need. There's a huge difference. A want is something that's superficial. I may want money. I may want that the person has two houses. I may want that he or she is tall, blonde, blue eyed. That's a want, that's superficial. A need is something else. A need is a character trait, there's a midah that I need, such as kind, considerate, generous, someone who's emotionally available and stable, someone who wants to have children, someone who's growing spiritually, someone who's learning Torah. That's a need, and that's what we should be searching for. So let's, let's start tonight's discussion by asking a couple of questions and ask ourselves, am I saying yes to any of these questions? I find it difficult to grow beyond my childhood dreams as I search for a spouse. Is that you? I don't give much thought to my future spouse. I'm sure that when I meet him or I meet her, I'll just know. Big fallacy, big myth. I fail to see a correlation between my own behavior and how it's affecting my quest for an appropriate spouse, as if I'm not getting in the way or I'm not causing the problem. I'm caught in a rut and I seek a partner who might not necessarily be the best one for me. Or I make decisions regarding a successful date simply on chemistry, nothing else. Nothing else goes into the equation. Or I look at advertisements of happy people and I wish I was in their place. Is that you? And if you're any one of those and you said yes to any of them, you're going to learn some things tonight that are going to shake up your, these myths. Let's start with a parable. And this will help us understand what are some of the mistakes that people are making today. Every morning, an elderly peasant set out at the crack of dawn with a sack of birdseed over his shoulder. He would begin at one end of the acre of his farm, rich soil that it was, and finish at the other side just as the sun was setting. So he was spreading seed, birdseed, from sunrise to sunset, or rather from dawn to sunset. Up and down the rows he went, sprinkling birdseed as he went. He would whistle to keep from becoming disheartened, for in all his years, not one plant had ever grown on his property. Nothing's doing, putting birdseed down, no plants growing. When the sun reaches its high point, a horse and rider came along and halted at the end of one row. As the peasant passed by, the rider called out, can I help you, old man? Want some help, old man? The peasant didn't bother to answer the rider. He just turned down the next row and continued scattering birdseed as he had done each afternoon for all those years before the rider came. At that moment, the peasant stopped in his tracks. His giant storehouse, which used to contain sacks of birdseed, was almost bare now. He was down to the last sack. The peasant put down his sack. He peered over at the rider, who was surprised that after so many years, the peasant seemed receptive. For all those years, the rider tried to help the peasant. No response. The peasant swallowed his pride and walked up to the rider with his head bowed. Without saying a word, the rider got down from his horse. He took a large sack off the back of the horse, placed it at the feet of the peasant, remounted, and rode away. The peasant looked curiously at the sack, threw it over his shoulder, and began to spread the seeds. Within a few days, green beans began sprouting everywhere. And here's what happened. All those years, the peasant was scattering bird seed. Obviously, the birds came and ate the bird seed. So as a result, nothing grew. Until finally someone told him, someone came, the rider, and showed him he was making a mistake. Don't scatter bird seed. You're not going to get food. No plants will grow. Try scattering seeds that belong to green beans. And once he did that, Green beans started to grow. And, they, and, and what's the nimshal here? What's the moral of the story? We continue to do it one way all our life. We don't want to take advice from anyone. We don't want to change our methodology. We don't want to tra- change the way we're doing things. And as a result, we keep continue getting the same result. Isn't it what Einstein once said famously? Insanity is doing it the same way again and again and again, expecting a different result. It doesn't go that way, ladies and gentlemen. In order to be able to get a different result, we need to change and modify the tactics. We need to execute differently. And that's what we want to try to teach tonight and for the next few weeks. What can we do to change our tactics? How can we become receptive to a different way of doing things so that as a result, our dating efforts will yield great fruit? So after 15 years, the author writes, of helping single people, there's one thing we've learned. People would rather do things their own way than listen to something new. Perhaps someone has a better idea that's more efficient and will yield some results. 
Dating is an emotional roller coaster. The most miserable time in one's life, possibly, most people will admit. Yet in order to attract someone, you're supposed to be happy and well adjusted. Nonetheless, most people we meet are quite hesitant to guidance about finding a full spouse. Only after they failed many, 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 many times, I see this in my life and in my practice all the time, will they finally acquiesce to coming and getting assistance and opening their minds to a different perspective of how to get it done. Compounding the problem are there many parents in Orthodox Jewish circles perhaps who just want the engagement without hearing about all the bothersome details of how to get there. They'd rather stay safely, wrapped safely in their delusions, waiting for Prince Charming or Princess Charming to come knocking down the door. Thus, we have a heartbreaking number of single people in our communities who have zero understanding of what they should be looking for in a future spouse, nor do they have the awareness that they need guidance. So many people today need guidance. Let me go out on a limb and say, anybody 25 years and older should have one session, a minimum of one session at least, with a dating mentor or a dating coach. That's critical. Because Hollywood notions or secular notions of the ideal mate that we're supposed to be married to have crept into our homes and in our minds. And they're affecting us deeply. We are much more superficial than our bubbies and our zadies. Again, we are much more superficial than our grandparents, than our grandfathers and grandmothers, who brought much more simplicity to the table when they decided to get married. Worse, there are a staggering number of unhappy marriages and divorces because people are getting based totally on the wrong criteria. They refuse to open their eyes during the dating process. They don't go about it in a logical fashion. And to answer the question that we asked before, should I date with our, my head or should I date with my heart? The answer is quite obvious. From a Jewish perspective, we date with our heads. If it's done that way in an intelligent fashion and I have designed a strategy and I execute that strategy, more than likely I will see success. Tonight, we'll start the process of educating you how to develop the proper intellectual or cerebral strategy to find your soulmate. Gaining clarity about what you truly need in a future spouse is the necessary effort or hishtadlut or shtadlus that will not only help you to find the right partner, but not only that, but will keep you and allow you to maintain a thriving, happy marriage. Unfortunately, just like the peasant that I just described in the fable continues to spread birdseed year after year, hoping that somehow plants will grow, it's often very difficult to see that our way isn't working, nor do human beings want to have the courage to admit that their methodology is all wrong. So let's start, let's start tonight with some cases to understand tonight's life. We're talking tonight about how to move that mountain. The mountain is the obstacle that's getting in the way, whatever that obstacle may be, and we're going to go through various types of obstacles. And our job is to be open-minded, get help, and move that obstacle, move around that mountain so that we can get to our desired destination. Let's talk about a young woman named Bela. Bela had finished seminary, which is a postgraduate uh, year or two of study in Israel after finishing high school in New York or America, working in the office of a Jewish day school. Although Bela had dated a few boys, nothing was working out. Bela's parents were concerned that perhaps she was doing something wrong or looking for something or someone unreasonable. Before agreeing to see Bela, we tried to get a sense of her parents. Were they justified that perhaps there was a serious problem? Or are they simply nervous parents that are getting uptight over nothing? I started by reminding them that God has a partner prepared for everyone, and the fact that Bela didn't meet her soulmate yet doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with her. I asked Bela, what are you looking for in a husband? And she rattled off stock answers. Well, a guy that's a good learner in Torah, someone who's diligent in yeshiva, and we asked, but what kind of character traits do you need to make you happy? She just answered, well, you know, a mensch, a nice, good man. And then we asked her if they've ever discovered, I asked the parents, have you ever discussed with Bela what her needs are? And the answer, well, we're just hoping when the right guy comes along, Bela will just know. This is not the way we date, ladies and gentlemen. It's not like, oh, when the person comes into my life, I'll just know. No, it doesn't work that way. That's too random and doesn't lead to disastrous results. Rather, if you create and craft a plan, you're much more sure that you'll find and you'll know the right person is in front of you. And this is a common mistake that people make. They rely on their gut feelings rather than a carefully thought out plan that will ensure the highest chance of success of finding a soulmate. 
This reliance upon making an emotional decision is based on feelings rather than on a sensible decision based on fact. It is further exacerbated by the misconceptions of parents from different generations who may not realize how much more difficult the shidduch process has become. Maybe perhaps 30 or 40 years ago was much easier, more simpler. Today life has become much more complicated. The matchmaking process has become much more complicated. People's needs and people's lifestyles have become much more complicated. And as a result today, we need to put some thought into crafting a plan before we go into the dating process. Bela was understandably easy to meet a dating coach. She wasn't exactly sure why she was there, but it was clear that her parents were anxious to marry her off. Calming her down and gaining her parents' trust was the first order of business. They needed to see that I was on their team and so did Bela. Okay, it seems that Bela's parents had allowed her to meet anyone who agreed to meet her. Huge mistake. You just don't go out with everyone. Because as a result, you're going to overdate, you're going to get burned out, you're going to get depressed. It doesn't work that way. You need to carefully create a plan of what you need to make you happy. And you need to select and, 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 and you know, curate out people that are right for you. You need to screen. Bela's parents assumed that if it worked out, then it would be fine. And if not, she'd just go on and keep dating more and more guys. The fact that she wasn't meeting the right one was shaking them up. Bela and her parents had no idea what they were looking for. So together, they worked on, let's, we worked on a list of what they considered to be necessary qualities for a good husband. They knew they wanted a boy who was learning and someone very kind, but they were surprised that Bela also wanted someone who was communally active, that he would participate in his community and practical in running a household. There's a little disagreement about whether Bela should marry someone from a very sheltered, isolated home or someone from a home where they were outgoing, more global, read newspapers, were more involved in the media, etc. It was an interesting process, but after an hour, we had a beautiful list prepared of De Bela's deepest needs. We discussed the need, obviously, to daven, which is to pray to God, because ultimately we need God's intervention to make it happen. And we need His input to make it work. And so I ran into Bela's mother at the supermarket soon thereafter, and she reported that, Data's, that Bela's dating was so more efficient, and she was enjoying herself so much more, and she was being more careful now. And they were able to screen, screen potential dates. And the dates she went on were much more focused. And ladies and gentlemen, it only took seven more months. But Bailey had the beautiful gift of clarity. She knew she was finding her shidduch and it happened very soon thereafter. Case number two, Ahuva. Ahuva and I met quite by accident. She was waiting like I was at the car, local car wash. And she sat down next to me holding a small tehillim or psalms. We recognized each other from the neighborhood. And so there was an awkward silence. And she knew that I was a dating coach. And so she said, I said to her, what are you looking for? And she said, are you a matchmaker? And I said, no, I know, but I try to help people guide them to, their, to finding their match by giving them clarity. Well, she said to me, Ahuva said, I'm looking for someone who learns. And what else? Someone who wants to settle in Israel, at least for the first few years, if not permanently. And again, the question pops up, but what character qualities are you looking for? What midos are you looking for? Which is, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most critical questions. Well, she wasn't familiar with that question because she never paid any mind to looking for, to checking the qualities of a young man. She just was interested, you know, where they went on vacations and where they spent their summers. So she said, well, I'm just looking for an all-around mensch. Again, stock responses. Do you mean, I asked her, mensch in the eyes of the neighbors? Or would you prefer someone who is less sociable, but would treat you properly? The question she was putting forward to Ahuva was, are you only concerned about what the Yentas think, what other people think? Or do you want someone who will treat you well? She looked confused. She says, well, I guess I want both. Nice to me and nice to everyone else. Someone who's outgoing, but yet involved in the congregation and will do lots of acts of charity. But also a family man. So I said to her, the dating coach said to her, that's a pretty tall order. And, and some of what you say contradicts each other. You want it to be outgoing, involved in the community, out there doing all types of voluntary acts of charity, but at the same time, it should be a family man. It's not possible to get everything. You can't have someone who's around all the time in the house, but at the same time, out there and involved in all acts of you know, communal activity. As should, and I said to her, a man involved with the, with the community may not be willing or able to help you with the kids, may not be able to sit with you with, for dinner, let me ask you this, if you had to choose between someone who's a community man versus a family man, 
Ahuva, what would you prefer? What would you choose? Ahuva looked at me. Who says I have to choose? Why can't I have both? Now, she was getting a little, you know, antsy and upset. Well, if you had two men in front of you, one was the center of attention of the community, and one doted on you hand and foot at home, who would you rather have as a husband, if you had to choose? Ahuva was annoyed, but she blurted out, well, of course, I'd rather have a family man. Ahuva seemed relieved to see that now her car wash, her car was washed and was ready to leave. She thanked me and made a speedy getaway. I didn't speak to Ahuva about getting married again, but amazing. I ran into her about six months later and she said, guess what? I'd like to invite you to my L'chaim. I was getting, she was getting engaged and you got to meet my future bridegroom. Wonderful person that he is. You'll love him. And when I arrived, the dating coach said, what a shock I had. Her groom was so shy. He was beat red throughout the L'chaim and could barely mumble a greeting to the people who were wishing him a hearty mazel tov. And she, there Ahuva stood next to him, beaming with pride at his side. As I approached Ahuva, she made sure no one could overhear what she was about to tell me. God surely put you in the right place at the right time when we both met at the car wash. I might have passed up on the most wonderful man in the world because he wasn't outgoing. I thought I needed an outgoing flamboyant guy, but here I am with a fantastic catch who's so shy. You made me see that I was placing emphasis on the wrong things that deep down wasn't important. How can I ever thank you? I smiled, got all choked up, and for once I could think of nothing to say. I just hugged Ahuva and said a silent prayer to God that they should be happy and have a wonderful life. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we have preconceived notions of looking for the wrong things, or we want a basket of goodies with all types of qualities in it. And some, many times these qualities are contradicting to each other, they oppose each other. And once you go to an individual who helps set you straight and create for you a top 10 list, which we'll talk about in the next coming weeks, you'll know exactly what to look for. Once you drag, craft a list of the top 10 needs of what you need in a guy or a girl, then when you date, you put these on an index card and you now you know what you're looking for. As I tell my clients and my students, all you need is to see if you have six out of the 10 qualities that you're searching for and you have physical attraction and you're on your way to success. Let's move on to the next case, Tsippy. Tippy, a girl, is one of the smartest women you'll ever meet. She sat across from me, eyeing me like, like a chess master. She has a brilliant mind. I sat back in my chair. I looked her over at her deep brown eyes. In a whisper, I asked, So, Tippy, what do you want out of life? Surprised by the question, she cracked a smile. She didn't hesitate and gave back the answer she knew well. To live a life of Torah and do mitzvahs, good quality acts. Yes, I replied, careful not to trample on her beautiful picture. But have you, you've been dating the best boys in the country for seven years now. Nothing's doing. Maybe you're doing something wrong that's getting in the way. And as a result, it's creating failure for you. She blushed and looked down. I waited patiently for Tippy to collect her thoughts. You have a point, she began. As I recommend to all my students, we made a list, a top 10 needs list for her, of what Tippy would need to be happy. There was a major problem, however. Number one on her list was that her spouse has to be a Torah scholar of great stature. She needs the best scholar in the yeshiva. Number two, that he has to have the ability to make her laugh. In our discussion about her past dating, it turned out that when she dated a boy whose Torah she could respect, which was great, she found those boys way too serious. When she found someone who delighted and amused her, well, they weren't smart enough. So as a result, she kept rejecting boy after boy because she wanted all the qualities, the top number one quality in all categories. She and her parents had come to the conclusion maybe she was doing something wrong. So there they were left with a quandary. At this point, the dating coach went to a rabbi and he advised her, as she writes, I was advised, Sippy should not look for the best scholar in the world, but a good enough guy, someone intelligent, but it doesn't have to be the next Einstein or the next you know, leader of the Jewish community. And then when it comes to someone who's humorous, he doesn't have to tell the best jokes and be the biggest comedian, but someone enjoyable enough to have company with. And third, the dating is not a game in which I'm constantly focusing on seeking out the person's faults. Rather, I should play up his good qualities and search for the good that he or she brings to the table. So at the next meeting, I shared these thoughts with Sippy as tactfully as possible, told her not to search for weaknesses. She listened and nodded. But she wasn't listening. A few days later, Tippy called to cancel the next meeting with the dating coach. 
She said that she felt that she was being forced to compromise her standards and her parents agreed with her and she was not going to compromise in any way. She needed the guy with the most brilliant mind but at the same time the best comedian in the room which really doesn't exist. They felt that she had the qualities to get everything on her list. We tried to explain that there's a difference between compromising your standards and recognizing that your expectations are impossible to be fulfilled. That she must focus on what she needs or risk, get, ra risk getting nothing. Mal, the dating coach writes, my heart aches to tell it, but it's already three years and Tzipi's still not married. Eventually I came to resign myself to the fact that I'd spoken from my heart. I had the authority of people guarding me. We're all creatures of habit. We are not inclined to change our way of thinking, especially if it threatens our fantasies of what we want. Sadly, I met with several people this week, a 45-year-old woman, a 56-year-old man, and I'm trying to get them to change and modify and adjust their plans, and I show them pictures of people that would be perfect for them. Too old, not too, not too skinny, even though they've gained weight, but they want the person to be perfect. So as a result, if they don't become realistic in their expectations, they're gonna remain single. And that's why we call tonight's lecture Moving the Mountain. We are the mountain, and sometimes it requires a great deal of effort to recognize the obstacles that we're putting in our own way and be willing to work at overcoming that obstacle. And that's important. Our next case is about a young man named Jason. Jason met a dating coach on the advice of his rabbi, who was exasperated by Jason's search for a beauty queen. Jason had traveled the world, he owned a boat, a rare sports car, worked with his father in a very successful family business. One summer, Jason arrived in Israel on vacation. He was not observant. Much to his parents' chagrin or embarrassment, Jason enrolled in yeshiva, fell in love with Torah, and stayed to study for several years in Israel, in Jerusalem, and became an observant Jew. Because he was, on, he was the only child, the parents adapted to his ways instead of rejecting Jason, and he was welcomed back to work for the father in the business. He had, Jason was successful in having shaken off most of the vestiges of his western, you know, way of old life. But he still clung to one misconception of the secular Hollywood world that his wife, that his future wife, had to be stunningly beautiful and very sophisticated. And he walked into the office of the dating coach with the air of someone who owns the place. So we asked him the question, why do you think you're not married yet, Jason? And he said, just because I haven't mess, met Miss Wright yet. So we asked him the question, how would you know if you met her or not met her? And he answered, well, I'll know when she comes into my life. Looking him directly in the eye, concerned that I wasn't getting anywhere with this overconfident fellow, I asked, so Jason, I noticed that when you pulled up to my office, you came in a Jaguar. Why do you drive a Jaguar? Drumming his fingers on his knee, Jason asked, where are we going with this line of questioning? Well, the dating coach says to Jason, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of why you're not married yet. If it's just because you haven't met the, the girl that's your soulmate, well then maybe you need to get out and meet more people. But perhaps if it's something you're doing that's getting in the way and stopping you from meeting her, then we need to figure out what that uh, you know, obstacle is. And my conclusions are, Jason, is that your Jaguar is getting in the way of meeting your soulmate. He looks at me and he stares at me. He wasn't too happy with that comment. Jason, I said, you're a strong individual, perhaps even a little bit arrogant. Your rabbi tells me that your growth in Torah learning has been amazing, that you're one of the top scholars in the yeshiva. And if you marry a gorgeous, sophisticated girl, she may pull you in a different direction than I hear that you want to head. You know, several years ago, I consulted in the case of a young man who was a brilliant Torah scholar, who was going out with someone seriously who wasn't the best candidate for him as a wife. As a matter of fact, she was pulling him away from his studies. And I met with him, and I met with him and, a, and his parents, and I made the recommendation, even though he was engaged, he'd be best off to break the engagement. Unfortunately, he didn't listen to me. And he went forward with the engagement, got married, was in misery for six months. Ultimately, it ended in divorce seven or eight months later. And simply was because of the fact he was, had this, conjured this thought in his mind, he had to have this woman that was sophisticated and stunningly beautiful. But it, that person did not support his learning, that did not support his spiritual growth. All that she did was get in the way and oppose all of it. And that created a lot of tension, a lot of argument, that ultimately led to divorce. And so she, the dating coach says to Jason, maybe you would grow more with a girl who isn't so worldly, but whose entire focus is creating a Jewish home. Someone who will help you to see that your money is not a privilege, but your money is an obligation to use it to help foster good in society. Perhaps a wife will humble you by her simple and simple devotion to God. That's what you need. And a girl like that doesn't care about your Jaguar and has no use for it. Jason stared at me dumbfounded and recovered quickly. But what makes you so sure, he said to the dating coach, that I can't have a gorgeous girl and the Jaguar? Well, maybe you can. 
But if you feel, find someone devoted, it may not be so important whether she's so sophisticated or not, but she takes care of you. She wants to build a Jewish home. She has what we call a year of Shemaim, fear of God. She's got, the, she's got all the qualities that we need in a great Jewish wife. Well, Jason said, I can see why my rabbi sent me here. He thinks my aspirations are too high and he wants you to talk me out of them. Maybe, I said, but maybe your evil inclination, or as we say in Hebrew, Yitzhara, is terrified that if you marry a wonderful woman and create a great Jewish home, you'll accomplish incredible things. So what does he do? The evil inclination keeps feeding you ideas of these fantasy women that have it all. The great beauty, the global mindset, sophistication, they don't exist. And meanwhile, what's he doing? He's pushing you further and further away from the goal of getting married to a woman that would care about you, nurture you, and have your back. So Jason said, what am I supposed to do? Well, Jason, I answered him, start by divesting yourself of these Hollywood implanted desires to marry someone who will impress others. How often does that happen, ladies and gentlemen, where people get married just because when they walk down the street, others should look at them and say, ooh and ah, when they come into a restaurant, people should notice them. Instead, try to find someone, Jason, who will meet your needs. And let's make a list of those needs. So they sat down and crafted a list of the things, the top, top 10 th needs that Jason would need in a woman. And the only way, she said to him, that you can determine if the person that's right for you is put the Jaguar aside and roll up to your date in a Toyota. And Jason did not like what he was hearing. And he said, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to do that. Well, I continued. Jason, you're used to getting everything you want and that's going to be a major obstacle for you. You think that you can get the best wife the money can buy? But you really need a wife who will bring out the best in you. That's critical, ladies and gentlemen. When you marry someone and you're dating someone, one of, often when I deal with people who are coming to me that are in the middle of relationships, I ask them, are you look for, looking forward to being with that person? Will that person bring out the best in you? Will they encourage and motivate you? Will, do they believe in your dreams? Have you communicated those dreams? And will they help you get there and help you squeeze out all the potential that you have? The only way to find out is to show up Jason to the date without all the trappings, without trying to impress her, without the Jaguar, etc. And that's very important. <clears throat> For a split second, I could see that Jason had absorbed what I had to say. And Jason flatly said, oh, well, I'm not pulling up in a Toyota. Whatever I answered, the point is, going out is not a shopping expedition. It's a process where each of you share who you are and what your goals are in order to see if they align together. Are we looking out in the same direction? And so, we made a list of Jason's needs. He was reluctant, but he decided to participate, and he helped me. And then he thanked me profusely. And then we let things go. Jason surprised me. I thought that he would never get past his arrogance and his media influence expectations. But the next time I saw him, two years later, he was having dinner with a sweet, simple-looking young woman wearing a head covering or a shaitl, a wig. I was too nosy. I just had to know, is that his wife? So I went over to say hello. As I approached, I overheard the young woman complimenting the waiter on amazing service. Jason saw me coming and he beamed and swelled with pride. Yes, this lovely, simple, unpretentious woman was indeed Jason's wife. Jason had successfully moved the mountain. He was able to overcome his initial stubbornness and move forward in his personal growth. The development and the continued development of Jason's qualities surely brought out the divine assistance necessary to find his partner. And so we conclude tonight's presentation by saying that we have to sit down, create a top 10 needs list. This should be done with someone like myself and if you need help in anything in dating, whether it's to find your soulmate, get matched up, help with the top 10 list, determine what's right and what's wrong, or just get dating advice if you're in a relationship or want to get into one, you can reach out to me at 305-206. 1916 again, cell phone 305 206 1916, or send me a WhatsApp or email to drjackcohen18 at gmail.com. I'm delighted to take the call. If you'd like to get more information, you can just simply go to my website, drjackdating.com, where there's plenty of resource material there to learn, to view, and surely you can, you know, you'll grow. But we need to move that mountain. Determining what that obstacle is, the first re required j job to do. So, I wish you all luck in doing that. Join us next Tuesday night as we move into the second phase of studying this amazing text. Have a wonderful night and I wish you all well.